wanted to be a star, but I always thought of a star more of uh, as a singing star and being on the Grand Ole Opry, being on stage and performing. But uh, I figured that if my career went the way I wanted it to, that I would eventually wind up doing the movies and, and Vegas. And it was a real fun thing. It's not uh, as exciting to me as my music, but it's certainly uh, you know something different, and I like a challenge. and the lame and the nails, but that woman is smart. And when the music starts, her head goes down, the wheels start turning, and she can give you a new lyric or a new melody in 20 minutes. She's brilliant. I love her. Everyone should have 30 seconds a day with that woman. Swear to God. Oh, and there's Dolly. Where is she? There's the woman. Dolly Parton's girly soprano voice and songs about old time virtues made her a major country star in the early 70s. Later in that decade, she wooed pop audiences and became a household name with her playful, self-deprecating comments about her blonde sex bomb image. Well, it's certainly been bizarre, hasn't it? <laughs> but I've always, you know, loved a lot of hair, a lot of makeup, a lot of shiny clothes and sequins, rhinestones, whatever. She won the hearts of millions of fans with her kindness and got the sweet nickname of Dalai Lama. Somebody says, oh, Dolly, you always just look so happy. I said, that's the Botox. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the collagen. More than 20 country and western number one hits, including classics like Here You Come Again, Jolene, 9 to 5, and of course, I Will Always Love You, which would become one of the biggest hits of the 90s making lots of cash for Dolly Parton, who, of course, as the writer of the song, was going cha-ching, cha-ching on the royalties. The days of living in a one-room log cabin were over. It was penthouse suites all the way for the rest of her life. Dolly would be rich forever, thanks to Whitney Houston taking her song and making it one of the biggest hits ever. From self-titled theme park Dollywood, television variety shows, and several successful films, including an Oscar nomination for her role in 9 to 5, Dolly Parton, a singular American superstar. I've been around a long time, and I, I've been in and out of this part of the world many times through the years, so I think people just kind of feel like they know me. I feel more like a family relative than a than a celebrity. I think they just kind of think, oh, Dolly's come home. Follow the story of the Queen of Hearts and Queen of Country, Dolly Parton. Parton is one of the most honored female country performers of all time. She's been with us forever. She will be with us forever. Dolly Parton will never die. 25 of her singles or albums have been certified gold, platinum, or multi-platinum. 26 of her songs reach number one on the Billboard country chart, a record for a female artist. She has had 42 top 10 country albums and 110 charted singles over the past 40 years, a record for any artist. I love to work. I mean, I, when I was just a kid, this was always my dream to travel all over the world and to write songs. That was my gift. And I just always wanted to make it into a business. And uh, year in and year out, a lot of my dreams that I plan, they come true, so you have to be responsible for them. And so I just try to keep up with the times as far as whatever's going on out there. And I hope to never retire, so I'm uh, up there now. But I actually have enjoyed every bit of it. I wake up every day with new dreams, so I feel like I'm just starting out. 
Dolly has sold 100 million records around the world. As a sign of Dolly's success and achievement, she was invited to perform as a headline act in 2014 at Glastonbury Festival in the UK. Good golly, it's Dolly. This was a really big deal because this isn't her typical crowd by any means. To bring a music icon, one of the greatest songwriters, one of the most successful music artists of all time to the festival is a really, really huge thing. This is a big deal. This is awesome. <laughs> Unlikely, but fantastic. A total triumph. She performed in front of 100,000 people at almost 70 years old. I'm just a country girl now, I feel like a rock star. <laughs> and to understand where such strength of heart and spirit comes from, we need to go back to the very beginning. different from me. I grew up in the mud. My daddy was a farmer. I grew up in East Tennessee over in America, so that was how we made our living on a farm. So uh, I thought, well, this is not all that different. You know, mud is mud wherever you are. Dolly Rebecca Parton was born January 19, 1946, in Locust Ridge, in the foothills of Tennessee's Smoky Mountains. Dolly Parton grew up dirt poor. To quote one of her songs, she was the backwoods Barbie. Um, she was the fourth of 12 children living in a one-room cabin. Can you imagine it? You know, that's uh, obviously great inspiration for country songs with that background. How poor was she? She was so poor that when she was born, um, her father couldn't afford to pay the doctor who delivered the baby uh, in cash, so instead gave him a bag of oatmeal. And that was the purchase which allowed Dolly Parton to enter the world. A replica of Dolly's childhood home can be seen in Dollywood, the artist's theme park in Tennessee, a family project that displays many original treasures from their days in Locust Ridge. With both their parents belonging to a Pentecostal church, the Parton children found music to be a large part of their experience of religion. Dolly started singing in church. Her grandfather was a preacher. Uh, she loved performing. She loved writing songs. Uh, she'd been writing songs since the age of seven. Um, she got her first guitar at eight, and uh, then she was performing on local uh, TV shows and radio programs at the age of 10. In 1959, age 12, Parton made her television debut on Knoxville TV. And in 1960, at age 13, she made her recording debut with a small label and appeared at the Grand Ole Opry, a weekly country music stage concert in Nashville, Tennessee. And she met Johnny Cash, and so that was really the start of her career. She already knew that she wanted to be a country singer. Johnny Cash encouraged her to always follow her instincts in her music and career. To thine own self be true, you know, those things. I think if you really take those and know who you are and know what it is that you want to do and just stick to your dreams and don't get sidetracked with other things, usually that'll, if you've got the talent and you've got the ambition, uh, that'll usually happen.
One day after graduating high school in Sevier County in 1964, Parton moved to Nashville, where she believed she had a better chance of starting her career. It was on her first day there that she met and fell in love with Carl Dean. Not a lot of people know who he is. He actually owns an asphalt road paving business in Nashville, Tennessee, but he just shies away from all the publicity. In fact, she says he's only seen her perform once in his entire life. We're very secure in who we are, and we love each other a lot. We met when I was 18 and he was uh, like 22 or a baby. And we, we've loved each other and we kind of grew into, you know, to a lot of the real deep feelings that we share. And he's very independent and I don't, uh, I want him to do what makes him happy. He wants me to do what uh, makes me happy. We're not jealous of each other as far as what, you know, our personality or of other people. And I don't know, we're together enough to really keep it exciting and apart enough to keep it exciting. Well, I don't uh, know that I want a child because I, I grew up in a family of 12 and when we married, uh, I took five of my younger brothers and sisters and we raised them until they married and moved away. So now they're having children and, and my nieces and nephews from these children uh, uh, call me a granny and call Carl Uncle Peepo. Dean, the mystery husband in all of show business. You know, for the longest time, I didn't think he actually existed. I mean, we never saw him. Uh, he's unusual among showbiz spouses in that he's never uh, at his wife's side at public events. In 2011, Carl and Dolly celebrated their 45th anniversary. The couple is still very happy and with no kids. Well, I insist on having a very private life. My, I've been married for 45 years come this May. And so my husband and I get along great. It's his first marriage and mine. And we like each other, but he does not want to be in the press. He's proud of me. He's proud for me. He loves hearing about it. He loves show business, as long as he can watch it from, uh, from his distance. chair and from, his, from a distance. But we get along great because he does not want the limelight and he's a homebody and I love to travel. So we, you know, we get along wonderful with that and I make it a point to protect his privacy and to protect our home life. And when I go home, that is private. And so it's true that you, you can have it all if you just work it right. Back in Nashville in 1964, Parton started writing some hit songs for other country artists. And then, in late 1965, aged 19, she signed with Monument Records, where she was not initially pitched as a country singer. She was told that her voice wouldn't suit country music. The vibrato was wrong. She was supposed to be a bubblegum pop artist. Imagine a sort of 1960s version of Britney Spears, and you kind of get how Dolly was, was marketed. So, you know, she, she did okay, and, uh, but she wasn't really sort of comfortable. She released a bunch of hits, but they didn't do well except for one, which was Happy Happy Birthday Baby, and that one hit the Billboard 100 charts. It was only after her composition, Put It Off Until Tomorrow, which went to number six on the country chart in 1966, that the label succumbed and allowed her to record country music. Her first country single, Dumb Blonde, reached number 24 on the country chart, followed by Something Fishy, which went to number 17. The two songs appeared on her first full-length album, Hello, I'm Dolly, released in 1967. That same year, Porter Wagner noticed the young 21-year-old Parton singing 
and invited her to join his weekly country music program, The Porter Wagner Show. So yes, it was 1967 that Porter Wagner, an established country star, invited Dolly uh, to perform with him, become a regular, on his hit TV show. It was a disaster from the start. Uh, the problem was Dolly was replacing someone called Norma Jean, a singer who was very popular uh, with the audience. She'd left the show, so Dolly would go out and, and sing to the audience and she'd get booed and jeered. They didn't care that she was good, they just cared that she wasn't Norma Jean. But as we've learned before, you know, Dolly's a survivor in show business. You you know, she doesn't uh, just run away uh, crying, she sticks it out, um, she sticks everything out, and uh, she gets in front of the, uh, the, the microphone, uh, she wins them over with her music, and eventually uh, she becomes a success on that show, and her and Wagner release uh, several records together, some hit duets, uh, and he's around for quite a long time in her career, getting her established, uh, producing her records, writing with her, and uh, was very much part of the Dolly Parton success story in the early years. And he used to wear a lot of rhinestone suits and, and all that, and that was the thing to do in, in country music. So once I got into that, I'd already been wearing the hair and the makeup. I thought, oh yes, you gotta shine. If you're gonna go on stage, you need to shine. Let people see you like you're a star. So I've always enjoyed dressing up, playing dress up. In 1969, while traveling with Porter Wagner on a tour bus, a song came to Parton. Unable to find paper, Dolly wrote the lyrics on the back of a dry cleaning receipt from one of Wagner's suits. The song was recorded in April 1971 and reached number four on the U.S. Country Singles Chart. It tells how Parton's mother stitched together a coat for her daughter out of rags given to the family. As she sewed, she told her child the biblical story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. Country music, it's all about authenticity. Uh, Dolly Parton's iconic 1971 live performance of Coat of Many Colors was basically her calling card in the industry, the one that made everyone sit up and take notice outside of Nashville, in the, in the world beyond, uh, because she told a story which was based on her own childhood. Uh, as, we've, as we've learned, that was pretty impoverished. And the, uh, the Coat of Many Colors, made by, made by her mother, the most famous coat in showbiz, still a signature moment in her concerts uh, today. A great song, very authentic. You write what you know, she sings about what you know, there's real emotion in that song, real truth, and it really uh, made, it, made it work back then as it works now. Parton kept the original coat, now on display in her Chasing Rainbows Museum at Dollywood. Although her solo singles and the Wagner duets were successful, her biggest hit of this period was Jolene. One of our biggest hits to date, and it's really iconic in the country music world. It was released in late 1973, and in the U.S. hit the top of the charts in February 1974. And I, I think it really represents an iconic moment in country music, but also it's an iconic song for her as well. According to Parton, the song was inspired by a redheaded bank clerk who flirted with her husband, Carl Dean, at his local bank branch around the time they were newly married. Throughout the song, Dolly desperately begs Jolene not to take her man.
Jolene, not just a fantastic song, also my ringtone. Now, there is a song that really proves how it survives. Um, so it hit uh, number one for Dolly in America in 1974, I believe. Uh, it took a couple of years to uh, cross over to England, but she cracked the top 10 in 1976 uh, with that one. And uh, yeah, Jolene, that was the uh, that was the one that got us started in, in Britain. We fell in love with her then, and we've never fallen out of love with her since. I love people and maybe it shows because I always say that I always see somebody I love and everybody I meet, like a family member, somebody always reminds me of somebody else. But I just love people and I've always been so grateful that people have accepted me and loved me all through the years and followed my career and kept food on my table, so to speak. <laughs> Parton stayed with Porter Wagner for seven years. To mark her professional break with him, she wrote a song in 1974, I Will Always Love You. This is the guy who had given her a chance on his TV show and had worked with her on her early records, establishing her path to fame. Uh, they had a professional split, but they remained friends, and so she wrote the song I Will Always Love You as a, as a tribute, never guessing, perhaps, that it would become the huge song that it did. If I should stay Parton was interested until Presley's manager told her that it was standard procedure for the songwriter to sign over half of the publishing rights to any song recorded by Presley. Dolly refused. That decision has been credited with helping to make her many millions of dollars in royalties from the song over the years. In 1992, the movie The Bodyguard was released starring Kevin Costner and Whitney Houston. The original soundtrack for the movie became the best-selling soundtrack of all time, and the lead single performed by Whitney Houston is a cover of I Will Always Love You by Dolly Parton. With 20 million units sold, Whitney's version of the song is the seventh best-selling single of all time. So Dolly Parton wrote the classic song, I Will Always Love You, but it was Whitney Houston who made it an international success, uh, becoming one of the biggest hits of all time and uh, making huge fame for Whitney, huge money, but also making lots of cash for Dolly Parton, who of course, as the writer of the song, was going cha-ching, cha-ching on the royalties. The days of living in a one-room log cabin were over. It was penthouse suites all the way for the rest of her life. Dolly would be rich forever, thanks to Whitney Houston taking her song and making it one of the biggest hits ever. And in 1994, it was Dolly Parton herself who gave the award for Best Female Pop Vocalist to Whitney. Uh, I'd like to thank Whitney for making my song such an enormous hit. And I really feel good about that because when I wrote that song 22 years ago, I had a heartache. But it's amazing how healing money can be. <laughs> Whitney In the mid-70s, Parton began to embark on a high-profile crossover campaign, attempting to aim her music in a more mainstream direction and increase her visibility outside of the confines of country music. 
In 1976, she began working closely with Sandy Gallen, who would serve as her personal manager for the next 25 years. What they decide is, now that she's established as a country artist, they need to take it to the next level. Uh, they need to cross over, uh, become mainstream, uh, go in the, in the pop direction. Uh, that's what she did. Um, uh, a large part of her success is due to Sandy Gallen. Uh, they teamed also in a TV production company called Sand Dollar. Uh, if you remember the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that was produced by Dolly Parton, you know, and Sandy, Sandy Gallen. So it was a partnership that extended beyond music uh, into TV and movies as well. They were very much on the same wavelength. He sensed that Dolly was very, very ambitious. She wasn't happy just hanging around Nashville to, uh, strumming a guitar and singing her country songs. You know, she wanted to be in the mainstream pop world and an international star. Sandy had been around showbiz for a while. He was the man to help her get there, and together they were a fantastic combination. With her 1976 album, All I Can Do, which she co-produced with Porter Wagner, Parton began taking more of an active role in production and began specifically aiming her music in the pop direction. Her first entirely self-produced effort, New Harvest, First Gathering, was released in 1977, but did not perform well but success eventually came later that year. So in 1977, she had an album called Here You Come Again, and it became her first million dollar seller. So this was exciting for her. She had teamed up with Gary Klein, who had helped her produce this album. And it was number one on the country charts, but it became number 20 on the pop charts. She was finally that crossover success. The song is a rare example of a parton hit that she did not write herself. Just when I'm about to get myself together, you waltz right in the door, just like you've done before, and wrap my heart around your little finger. Here you come again. The same track also brought her first Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal Performance. As a little girl growing up, she dreamed of being in that position. She'd worked really hard for it. She'd got through it on her own merits, um, writing songs, working with talented people, showing incredible drive. And when she stood there on the Grammy stage, you know, she'd finally joined the legends. But she wasn't finished. There were still new mountains to conquer. about it because it was the kind of thing that was so close to, to my own personality that I, you know, I didn't feel like I had really had to act or, or worry too much about it, although, I, you know, I wasn't all that great, but I mean, it wasn't like a real scary thing. Trying to expand her audience base, Dolly was wisely turning her talents to television. She proved to be a natural and was often in talk shows and on TV specials. In 1976, she got her own variety talk show, simply titled Dolly. It achieved high ratings, but managed to last only one season, with Parton negotiating out of her contract, citing stress to her vocal cords. But Parton's big screen debut was astoundingly successful. She played a brassy Southern woman, Dora Lee Rhodes, in 9 to 5, opposite Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda in 1980. Well, I think Jane is a very complex person. I think she's very intelligent, very creative. I find her uh, very caring, but I find her also very shy and uh, almost uh, naive in a very sweet little girl way. And it's the side of her that I really uh, was surprised to, uh, you know, to find. Nine to Five was a huge hit. It was a successful movie, but also the song Nine to Five was a monster hit. And she actually had a triple hit there because it was number one on the country charts, the adult contemporary, and the pop charts 
simultaneously. And it also got her an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. The music video to 9 to 5 is great because it's just classic, iconic moments from the film. So you get to see Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin and Dolly tying up their boss that they can't stand, Dabney Coleman, you know, kind of kidnapping him and uh, giving him a taste of his own medicine. So throughout that entire song, you see all those fun moments from the film. The title track won two Grammy Awards for Best Country Song and for Best Female Country Vocal Performance. So suddenly, uh, she was a music star, she was a movie star, the world was Dolly's Oyster. Well, I wanted to be a star, but I always thought of a star more of uh, as a singing star, and being on the Grand Ole Opry, being on stage and performing. But uh, I figured that if my career went the way I wanted it to, that I would eventually wind up doing the movies and, and Vegas. And it was a real fun thing. It's not uh, as exciting to me as my music, but it's certainly uh, you know something different, and I like a challenge. The success of the movie was adapted for Broadway at the start of the new century. Dolly Parton wrote the music and the lyrics for it. Well, I've never done Broadway. This is the first time I've done anything here. And so when Bob Greenblatt, who produced the 9 to 5 musical, uh, he asked me if I'd write it since I had written the theme song 30 years ago for the movie with Jane Fon and Lily Tomlin. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try. And uh, I did, and four, year, four years later or more, here we are. The musical premiered in Los Angeles in September 2008 and opened on Broadway New York in April 2009 with Megan Hilty taking over the role of Dora Lee Rhodes. Well, actually, I'm very proud of Megan Hilty, and I think they make too much out of the fact that she's playing Dolly Parton because she's really not. We both were playing Dorley Rhodes, who's the character, because when I did the movie, I wasn't really being Dolly Parton. I mean, they were trying to get me to play a girl from Texas, and I'd never been a secretary, so we're both acting. But the fact that I was in the role first and had the big boobs and the little waist, but she's got a beautiful little body. she got plenty of stuff of her own. They just kind of tried to make it look a little more like that, but she's certainly a nice reflection on me. I was never that cute, so when they say that, I think, yes. You know, but she's done great with her acting. She didn't really need pointers from me. It received 15 Drama Desk Award nominations, the most received by a production in a single year, as well as four Tony Awards nominations, including Best Original Score for Dolly Parton. Well, I feel great. I feel proud and honored and humbled by the whole thing. It's uh, one thing to get a chance to write something for Broadway, but it's another entirely to be nominated for a Tony Award. So it's, it's been a great thrill. Amazing. I think people are under the impression that she kind of popped in and popped out. She was an integral part of our daily rehearsal. And um, she was there, I think she just recently left maybe three or four days ago. She was there for every preview performance, in the wings, giving us high fives, the greatest support. And you know, you see the glamour and the wigs and the lame and the nails, but that woman is smart. And when the music starts, her head goes down, the wheels start turning, and she can give you a new lyric or a new melody in 20 minutes. She's brilliant. The thing that's brilliant about Dolly is, is this is a woman that does not need to do this. She wants to do this. It's a first time experience for an icon. And to have shared that with her and collaborated with her, and it's her first time collaborating like this. To have people sit down and say, I need this or I need that, well, she's not used to that. And she's been so open to the process and really gotten into it. It's an honor. I love her. Everyone should have 30 seconds a day with that woman. My work. I love what I do. I'm just thankful I've had the opportunity to make a living at what I love to do. And that's such a wonderful cast and crew over there. Working with them has been a true joy. And no matter whatever happens with the show, if it lasts forever or just a, a month, it, I wouldn't take nothing for this experience. The Broadway production, however, was short-lived, closing in September 2009.
but a national tour of the U.S. was launched in 2010 and followed by a U.K. premiere in 2012. So by the early 80s, Dolly Parton is a showbiz colossus, bestriding the worlds of both movies and music. She has another box office hit with The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, uh, a controversial but successful acting choice. And then she hits the top of the charts again, duetting with Kenny Rogers on Islands in the Stream. Uh, actually, not a song she wrote this, this time, but written by the Bee Gees. Released in 1983, Islands in the Stream knocked Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart out of number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and spent two weeks there. It sold more than two million copies in the United States. 22 years later, in 2005, the song was voted best country duet of all time on the country music television. Parton and Rogers were reunited to perform their massive hit. It was a smash hit on both the country and pop charts and won too many awards to mention. Islands in the stream, that is what we are. In 2013, Parton and Kenny Rogers reunited for the title song of his album, You Can't Make Old Friends. So Dolly was on top of the world. She had 12 top 10 hits in the mid 80s. But it's kind of interesting because in 1986, when her contract was up with RCA Records, it expired and they didn't renew the contract. So Columbia Records snapped her right up and she was well on her way again. And then she teams up with Emmy Lou Harris and Linda Ronstadt on the album Trio. And, and that brings her another Grammy Award. I mean, she was running out of space on her mantelpiece. There were so many trophies coming her way. The album spent five weeks at number one on Billboard's Country Albums chart, selling several million copies and producing four top 10 country hits, including the cover of Phil Spector's To Know Him Is To Love Him. In 1989, one year after winning the Grammy for Best Country Performance Duo or Group with Vocals for the album Trio, Dolly played the role of Truvy Jones in the highly acclaimed movie Steel Magnolias. Well, they'll feel like that it's touched every emotion in their body. You laugh, you cry, you, it brings you closer to family, it brings you closer to friends. It's about family, love, and friendship, and people, and life in a small town. And I think it's just about the human heart. The same year, Parton released her album, White Limousine, and spawned two number one hits. With Why'd You Come In Here Looking Like That? and yellow roses. But by the beginning of the 90s, Dolly started to struggle with her country music career. Dolly wanted to get back to her country roots. That's what releasing the country album White Limousine was all about. But this was a changing time in country music. The veteran performers, which by now included Dolly, were being pushed out. And suddenly, a new uh, batch of emerging young performers uh, were the ones who were really sort of exciting Nashville. She suddenly finds herself as a queen without a country. Uh, she thought that she would return to Nashville in triumph, but it's like, no, that's okay, Grandma. Uh, we got these kids now, uh, you know, strumming the guitar. So it was a bit of a confusing time for, uh, for Dolly. In 
the mid-1990s, finding her new songs less well-received on the country charts, she shifted to bluegrass music and released the critically acclaimed Grammy award-winning albums The Grass is Blue in 1999 and Little Sparrow in 2001. Her album Halos and Horns in 2002 included Parton's bluegrass version of the Led Zeppelin classic Stairway to Heaven. Throughout the 1990s, Parton also worked a lot in television. She was involved in producing voice work, often playing herself for animated television series, such as Alvin and the Chipmunks in 1987, The Magic School Bus in 1994, and The Simpsons in 1999. this is all about. We're very excited about the Imagination Library being here. I got to make sure I say your town right. It's Rotherham? Did I get it right? I've been practicing because it don't look like that on paper. In the States, anything that's H-A-M, we have to say Rotherham, right? I like Birmingham. Anyway, so we are very happy to be here. And of course, the Imagination Library is a program very dear to my heart because this is something we started back in the States about 10 years ago. It was something just for my people in my county, in my hometown, and of course, it just kind of took off and now it's all over the United States. We're in about 700 counties in about 42 states, and we've given away four and a half million books this past year, and in about two months, we're gonna be giving away our 11 millionth book. So that's a lot of books to go out to a lot of kids. The Imagination Library started in Sevier County in 1996. It is part of the Dollywood Foundation and has since expanded to over 1,600 local communities in the U.S., Canada, and United Kingdom. It has gone from just a few dozen books to over 60 million books mailed each month and reaching over 750,000 children. Already, statistics and independent reports have shown Dolly Parton's Imagination Library drastically improves early childhood literacy for children enrolled in the program. Further studies have shown improved scores during early literacy testing. It started because of a lot of my own relatives that didn't get a chance to go to school, couldn't read and write. My own father grew up very poor and very large family, didn't get a chance to go to school, so he couldn't read and write, but he was so smart. And so it, and uh, several of my other relatives as well. So I wanted to start it where children can learn at a very early age to love books, to learn to read. It helps to bring the family together. You have, must pick up a child if it gets its own little book in the mail, which they do with its own little name. You know, they're gonna, you're gonna have to read to that child. So it is my belief that if you can read, whether you get a chance to go to college or even to school or to afford it, if you can read, you can self-educate yourself. So it was really about, it started from a very sincere and honest little place. Then it got all over Tennessee. The governor uh, at that time, uh, Governor Phil Bredesen took it. It was all over Tennessee. Then it went all over the United States. Then we went to Canada with it. Then we came to Rotherham here in England. And now we're opening in Scotland. And so it's gonna, just a way to get books in the hands of, of kids from the time they're born till they start kindergarten. It would 
would be great. In fact, I told him at Dollywood, I need to bring this home because we need a gold Oscar at the Dollywood Museum. So uh, whether I win or not, it's going to be fun, and I'm going to take pictures of everything, just as if I want to put it in the museum anyway. <laughs> In 2006, Dolly was going again to Hollywood. So it's fun and I'm very excited that my song was nominated. I'm excited that I get to sing it on the show. And, and I'm excited I get to see all these big old movie stars. I'm still that much of a hillbilly. It's a thrill. <laughs> and among them, is there somebody you really want to see tonight and touch base with? Well, I want to see them all. I got to speak with George Clooney yesterday. We worked together for a while. Oh, he's knockout and the nicest guy. She had written the lead single, Traveling Through, for the movie Transamerica, starring Felicity Huffman. This got her her second Academy Award nomination for Best Original Song, but because the movie was about a transgender woman, Dolly received a lot of death threats because people were upset by the subject. The song is about a journey on the road to find home and identity. Parton said she wrote the song because she believes that it's all right to be who you are. She gave a rousing performance of the song live on stage during the Oscar ceremony in March 2006. The song did not win the Oscar that year, but at the end of the 2000s, Dolly was back in the music scene. Showbiz careers are very much like roller coasters. You know, there's full of ups and downs. And, uh, you know, in recent years, uh, Dolly Parton has really been embraced as a, as a great survivor. She seems to have been with us our, our whole lives. And then a whole new generation, you know, have discovered and keep discovering Dolly's music. You know, it's passed down from parents to kids. Uh, these, are, these are timeless songs. In 2011, she released an emotional album, Better Day. Well, this new album, I've written all the songs on it as well. It's called Better Day. And it's just really a, a, an album that has more of an uplifting message in it. Even the love songs, even some of the sad ones about losing is saying, I'm gonna pick myself up, I'm stronger than you might know, and I'm gonna start again and, and do better. But a lot of the songs are really just about uh, true love and uh, just about things are not good right now, but things go in cycles, everything's gonna get better. And that's basically what the song says, the blues ain't here to stay, there's a better day and that'll move away because we're gonna actually do better. So we thought we'd call the t uh, tour that as well and do a lot of uplifting songs, stuff that make people feel good at a time when, when it's kind of rough on a lot of folks. Parton said that Better Day was inspired by the disparate world problems, such as the Japanese tsunami, the ongoing conflict in the Middle East, and America's economic crisis. The lead single, Together You and I, was originally written in the early 1970s and recorded with Porter Wagner on their 1974 collaborative album. Martin then embarked on her Better Day World Tour with 49 shows around the world. For 
first of all, I love to perform. I love my band. We've been doing this together for oh, 30, 35 years. And some people have been in my band even a little longer than that. But it's like a family. We love, we love being together. We love the audience. We love performing. And we just had such great time the last two times we were in, in this part of the world. We, and fans wanted us to come back. We thought, well, we'll just keep going back till they tell us to stop coming. So we're very excited about it. We actually start the tour in, um, in the States in July. And then we come here in August. And uh, then we go to Australia in November. So we're actually going to pretty much be, we'll have some time off in between, but we'll be spending the rest of the year on tour because we love it and we're promoting the new album. And so we'll have some new things to do in the show. Of course, we'll continue to do the classic songs that people know and want to hear, but we'll have some new, new things to do, some comedy, some fun pieces that they haven't seen. So it won't be an exact duplicate of what they've seen before, so they can look forward to some new stuff. Her 42nd solo studio album, Blue Smoke, was released in the U.S. in May 2014 and debuted at number six on the Billboard 200 chart, making it her first top 10 album and her highest charting solo album ever. The Blue Smoke World Tour would take the artists all the way to the Glastonbury Festival in the UK. Unlikely, but fantastic, a total triumph. First of all, I am really excited. I can't believe that I've never done this before, but it never has worked out to where we were in this part of the country during the time that, you know, you were doing the festival. But I have done several shows before, but nothing, as they tell me, that's, that's this big. But I'm excited about it, and I, we've done a lot of outdoor shows, a lot of fairs and that sort of thing, so I'm kind of used to kind of playing out, outdoors. But this is going to be a big deal, and since this is the biggest festival in the world, I even wrote a song about the mud, so we'll be doing that in the show. I thought, well, we have to write a song about the Glastonbury mud, even though the sun's shining today. Um, but anyhow, we're excited about it. June 29, 2014, she performed in Glastonbury at the Music Festival. This was a really big deal because this isn't her typical crowd by any means. She had a huge crowd of over 100,000 people. They were all there to hear her classic songs, everything from 9 to 5 to Jolene. It was kind of tricky knowing what to do in a, under a festival situation because you, in my show as a rule, I usually do a couple of hours and they said you can't do but an hour, maybe hour and ten. So I thought, well, I can't do a whole bunch of sad, slow songs because everybody's drunk and high. So <laughs> I thought, we don't want to bring them down that bad. So I thought, well, there's two or three songs they have to hear, like maybe Code of Many Colors and a few things that, you know, just part of my whole life and my background. But we've tried to do a set where we can kind of keep it moving pretty good. Dolly received an impressive award for 100 million records sold worldwide. She performed her all-time classics and also new songs, including her cover of Bon Jovi's hit, Lay Your Hands On Me. And she had a little surprise for her fans. In fact, Richie Sambora is going to come perform with me tonight. He was at the O2 in London, so he's going to come play on Lay Your Hands On Me because he co-wrote that with John Bon Jovi, of course. there was an even bigger song that everyone had come to sing along.
Besides all her musical finesse and acting talent, Parton is a savvy businesswoman and heads Dolly Parton Enterprises, a $100 million media empire. She has owned two radio stations and continues to co-own Sand Dollar Productions, a highly successful television and film production company. She is the owner and founder of Dollywood, her theme park in Tennessee, and owns a lot of lands in the region. In fact, I was telling someone earlier, uh, I have a lot of land up in East Tennessee, and we do a lot of festivals through my Dollywood company. And I've often thought that I might start having a, a festival up in East Tennessee, so maybe I'll get some good pointers from this one. Dolly has been a major influence on new artists. She is Miley Cyrus's godmother, who, as her, made a successful crossover between country and pop. So Dolly definitely influenced Carrie Underwood, Taylor Swift. She made it possible for all of these country artists to cross over into the pop world. They would not have the same success had Dolly not paved the way for them. Taylor Swift's latest album, 1989, uh, she announces her first ever pure pop album, signifying her move away from country. Uh, she's even uh, dabbled in movie acting as, as well. So, you know, she's the, new, she's the new Dolly Parton. Well, you know, she's deficient in a couple of areas, but, you know, who can match uh, Dolly everywhere, let's face it. At almost 70 years old, and after more than half of a century career, she continues to love life and to be grateful every day. She was saddened by the death of her close friend Michael Jackson in 2009 and recorded a tribute to the King of Pop. I always thought Michael had the heart of an angel, and I'm sure that he's rejoicing with him now. Of course, we'll all miss him, but I know that he'll live on through his music. And this should remind us all to treat every day as our last and let people in our lives really know how special they are to us. In 2012, Whitney Houston passed away, letting Dolly declare, I will always love you, Whitney. Dolly continues to live near Nashville and to share the love on stage with her fans. Dolly Parton is one of the great showbiz icons, uh, one of the all-time great performers. She's been with us forever. She will be with us forever. Dolly Parton will never die. She will just go on singing those great songs, sending herself up. Let me tell you why I think she survived for so long. It's because she has a quality that the great stars need if they want to stay around, and that is being self-deprecating. She's always happy to make herself the butt of the joke. That's what makes her relatable. No diva behavior. She sends herself up. Everybody loves her. And as well as everybody, you know, continuing to love her, they continue to love her music. Her songs are timeless, they'll be with us forever, and I hope Dolly will be too. Actually, I'm always doing, saying all my little silly stuff. I never know what's going to come out of my mouth next. But anyway, we just, uh, you know, people just get a kick out of the funny stuff I say, or the cute things, or my take on certain things. So. Uh, that's one of the things that we do. 